three. I can tell why this man. I, I, she said, she, One second. I can't believe. I still couldn't lock out left the call. Good up. evening. Sorry. I am calling the February 8th, 2018 Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee meeting to order. Welcome, everybody. The first item we have is the adoption of the agenda. Do I have make a motion? Make a motion to adopt the agenda. I second. I second. Okay. Would everybody like to vote on that? Raise your hand if you're in favor of that. Okay. <laughs> the next we have is the approval of the main approval of the minutes from December 14th, which I guess was our last meeting. <laughs> Do we have a motion for approval of those minutes? I make a motion. Second. All in favor? Okay. Approval of the minutes. Our first subject is Groundwater 101 with Dr. Richard Sproul. I'm going to hand it over to you and Wally. Good evening, Madam Chairperson, uh, Water and Sewers Advisory Committee members. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Sproul. He is a hydrogeologist with um, GMA, Groundwater Management Associates. I don't have to say the whole word Everybody's very good. often. So, um, but Dr. Sproul actually works a lot with us on um, managing our aquifers and our water supply system. He participates with us on the Regional Water Resources Group. And I've asked him, we actually had a meeting today, and we were lucky enough that he was willing to stay over and basically go through a um, Groundwater 101 for the benefit of the board and, and the viewing public, as well as kind of give you an update on where we are with some of our efforts. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sproul. Well, thank you all, and thanks for this opportunity to come down and speak with you. I enjoy working in Oslo County. I've been working in the county now for almost 20 years on various projects, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's an area of great interest to me, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I, I usually stand in front of the whiteboard and talk, so I'm, I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage here in that I've told, I've been told I have to sit down at this particular seat and can't move very far. So I'm going to do the best I can with the electronics that you have. It's a pretty, pretty amazing system. Um, I'm titled my little talk, uh, Groundwater Resources of Onslow County, or How to Ensure Water for All, because it's a really diverse county with respect to the nature and extent of the different types of aquifers that underlie um, this um, interesting county. I want to start off with just a simple uh, slide here to make a couple of impo important points. Uh, groundwater occurs in the pore spaces between individual grains of sand. For example, in this particular sketch, see the pore space right there, I'm coloring it in in red, is the place where water occurs. Uh, in this case, all the grains are about the same size, so there's a lot of water in the pore spaces. Where the grains are different sizes, uh, as illustrated here, there's a different amount of water. So different types of materials have different amounts of water in them. And so uh, I want you to know that there are no, in this area, lakes of water. There are no rivers of water underground to speak of. The water that you consume comes from the pore spaces between grains of sand, silt, and clay. Uh, there's an exception to that, and that is this one layer that underlies this region that we call the Castle Hain Aquifer. And it tends to be composed of limestone, and limestones tend to have larger pore spaces in them. As a general rule throughout this county, the limestone that I'm going to show you doesn't have any big pore spaces like this particular illustration right here uh, that shows some large caverns underground. These would be the kind of caverns you'd find up in the mountains, for example, Carlsbad Caverns or Lou Ray Caverns. We don't have that here. Uh, I wanted to share with you a piece of the Castle Hain limestone to get across the point that uh, the limestone has some pores in it. Uh, and that's where the water is located in this particular rock. This rock's about 40 million years old, and it was formed when the ocean covered this area. And what you can see is that there's still evidence of shells in the rock, and now those shells have been dissolved out. And so the water is flowing through those pore spaces in this rock in this important unit called the Castle Hain. So I, I brought this to share with you. You've probably seen it all around this area as, as material to stop erosion and to put on your yard with smaller fragments. We use it in the construction of septic tanks, things like that. In, in contrast, uh, the other aquifers I'm going to tell you about today that underlie the Castle Hain, that limestone, are actually composed of sand. Many of them represent old sand deposits from rivers that flowed 200 million years ago across this area that we call the coastal plain. 
And in this particular little jar of uh, material, you'll see that the sand grains are not stuck together. And so in the deep aquifers, I'm going to describe to you today as the, cat, as the Cretaceous aquifers, representing a time period when these sands were deposited, or actually deposits of sand. And the water in these sands is like this illust particular illustration here at the top, where the water is in the pore spaces between those grains of sand. And it's our challenge to figure out how to get usable quantities of water out of those pore spaces within those grains of sand. So two types of pore spaces. The pore spaces in the limestone, they tend to produce a whole bunch of water. And then the pore spaces between grains of sand and the deeper aquifers that underlie this region. So I hope I've convinced you that there are no rivers of sand here, no underwater lakes of sand. The water's in the pore spaces uh, down there. And again, it's our job to figure out where those uh, layers that have the largest pore spaces are and the most abundant pore spaces so we can get the largest volume of water out of the system. If you were to walk right outside this building today and, um, and dig a hole in the ground and, and make a well out of it, you might find this, this particular situation. Uh, uh, a hole uh, eight feet deep in this area uh, might look like this particular well that I'm showing with that little U-shaped pattern. And what we would find at about two feet or three feet below the land surface in this area is that water would fill up the well. And that water level right there is called the water table. Uh, you might have seen out in the old farmstead in this area uh, a house built on top of a well with a, a crank system and a bucket that goes down here and takes the water out of the well. Those are really shallow wells uh, in, this, in this area that do indeed represent uh, groundwater. Uh, but since the 1950s and 1960s, we haven't used water from wells like this shallow one that we call the unconfined aquifer, or the superficial aquifer, and that's because the water quality is not exceptional. Usually it's problematic. It wasn't unusual in this area to have another house right over here next to a well, and that house might have had a half moon on the door. And, and so the unmentionables uh, might have been placed down into a an area under that particular house in an outhouse, and then we'd have a well not far away from it. So we realized that that was not a healthy situation. And so starting in the 1950s and 60s, we realized that if we drill deeper wells, like this one called this artesian well, that we could drill down below clay layers like this one that have water in them but doesn't transmit that water very much, very easily, that we protect this deeper zone from the shallower zone that has poorer water quality. In many of these wells drilled down into a limestone right here in Onslow County, like the limestone I've shared with you, the water level in the well would rise above the top of the aquifer at the well and would rise all the way to this level right here. And so it's not unusual to find wells that tap deep parts of the groundwater system and that water is pressurized and so the water can rise up well above the water table in the shallow aquifer, which is right there. And so we call these things uh, artesian uh, aquifers or artesian wells. And so most of the uh, uh, topics that I'm going to discuss tonight have to do with these aquifers, these layers that transmit water like limestone or sand that are down appreciable distances of 100 feet to 500 to 1,000 feet below the land surface. And I'm not going to talk about this shallow water, although it's really, really important to us. It's not used as a drinking water supply anymore in this county. Okay, so uh, that's sort of Geology 101. If you were to go to uh, North Carolina, the great Tar Heel State, you'd recognize three different provinces, uh, Mountainous Province here, uh, Piedmont Province located here in, in this pattern, and then two shades of green, the Coastal Plain Province of North Carolina. You, you'll recall that uh, I-95 follows the boundary between the Coastal Plain and the Piedmont and sort of swings over like this and on down like this. So I-95 really separates the Coastal Plain, that's this province, from the Piedmont of North Carolina. If I were to start right here and go right through Onslow County like this and lift up the earth and look at it from the side so that A would be about right there and A, uh, sorry, B would be about right here and I'm gonna cut right through the coastal plain right there and lift it up and look at it from the side, this is what we'd find. We'd find a whole series of layers of sand, silt, clay, and an occasional limestone that dips off towards the east. This is east over here, east over here towards the ocean, and west over here. And these layers have been named by geologists on the basis of whether or not they transmit usable quantities of water. So I'm going to start at the bottom and point out that down here, there's bedrock. And the bedrock is at distances or depths of 
near the near the land surface at the I-95, the beginning of the coastal plain, and it's over 10,000 feet below the land surface at Cape Hatteras, and it's 40,000 feet below the land surface, 30 miles, 40 miles offshore. And so these rocks are not rocks that we use out here in the coastal plain as our sources of water. Instead, we use these layers of sand like this one and the one sitting on top of that one as our sources of water. And we geologists have named these layers things like the lower Cape Fear Aquifer and the upper Cape Fear Aquifer, this one, and the Black Creek Aquifer. And I'm going to circle, uh, underline that one because it's really important to you here in Onslow County. It's this deeply buried Black Creek Aquifer. Then there's one called the PD Aquifer up here. And on top of that, there's a whole series of uh, big thick layers that we call the tertiary aquifers. And I'm going to show you in a minute that this particular layer right here is really important in Onslow County because it's the Castlehane Aquifer system. And it sits on top of these older aquifers. So Lower Castlehane, Upper Castlehane, Black Creek, and PD were deposited out here in the coastal plain 200 million years ago when the dinosaurs were walking around the earth. They're really, really old geological formations. Because they're deeply buried 500 or more feet here in Onslow County, it takes a long time for the water to get into them, and so the water is exceptional in quality. Do you remember the uh, sign on the town of, uh, of uh, Richland that said the town of perfect water? And that's because they were tapping these uh, deeper aquifers that have really super quality water. These things are the Cretaceous aquifers, and I need you to memorize that and remember that for the purposes of my talk. On the top up here, there's a Castlehane aquifer. I want to further point out this green line that kind of goes like this and it comes around like this and goes around here like this. That's the boundary in the subsurface out towards the ocean between salty water right here in the pore spaces and fresh water over here. And geologists call that the salt water, fresh water boundary. And we kind of know where it is, but we don't know exactly where it is, especially in the deeper aquifers. And I'm going to tell you tonight that what we've been doing in the county is trying to figure out exactly where it is for lots of different reasons. Um, you're, you're blessed in Onslow County, first of all, with an incredible supply of water that's both fresh and then salty in the deeper parts of the aquifer system. So a major point I'd want to make to everybody here is that you're not going to run out of water in Onslow County. Uh, quite the contrary. We have an almost inexhaustible supply of water in Onslow County, but much of it is salty at depth. But that's okay because we know how to take the salt out of water. We've been doing it on Navy ships and all across the coastal plain in North Carolina for long periods of time. Okay. so. Um, that's geology 101. So here we go, uh, coastal plain hydrology again. You know the deep aquifers are called Cretaceous and the shallow aquifers are called the Castlehane. <clears throat> the Cretaceous aquifers, there's that word, Cretaceous aquifers are the deep ones. And I'm going to focus today on the Black Creek and the Upper Cape Fear aquifer. In contrast, uh, sorry, the city of Jacksonville out towards uh, Richlands uh, has wells that are in the Cretaceous aquifers. You've got quite a few of them. And they would draw water from depths of 400, see it, 400 to 500 feet below sea level. They're pretty deep wells. And the water quality is really nice. It's really high quality water and you really don't have to treat it. So I'm getting across the point that uh, in Onslow County, the city of Jacksonville and Onslow Water and Sewer Authority have some deep wells set into these Cretaceous aquifers. In contrast, <clears throat> the Castlehane aquifer sits on top of the Cretaceous aquifers. That's that limestone that I pointed out to you. And people like Camp Lejeune have all of their wells, m more than 20 of them, all in the Castlehane aquifer, and they don't pump any water at all from the Cretaceous aquifers. So in this area of Camp Lejeune, they drill down about 100 feet to 200 feet max, and they don't drill any deeper than that. And you can see why on this illustration. See this? If you drilled any deeper under most of the Marine Corps base, what would you find? Salty water in the aquifers. And so they've been, been utilizing this Castlehane younger 40 million euro aquifer for long periods of time. All right, so uh, I'm going to get rid of these words. Um, people have been pumping the Cretaceous aquifers, Lower Cape Fear, Upper Cape Fear, Black Creek, and PD since the 1960s. The water levels have been falling almost through that entire time because those deep aquifers that you utilize here in Onslow County, and we utilize them in Greenville and Kinston, all the way down to Jacksonville, are really deep, and it takes a long time for the water to get down into those aquifers. And so what's hap what happened was that the water levels as early as 1979, this is water level elevation, starting to decline. I don't think it's necessary for you to see, know these numbers. I just want to get across the point that we've been taking more water out of the Cretaceous aquifers 
than can make it back into the Cretaceous aquifers by rainfall. And so we've been depleting them. And so everybody in North Carolina who knew something about groundwater resources said this is an unacceptable situation and we needed to deal with it. So in the early, um, in the, um, about 20 years ago, we said we got to do something about this problem and we passed the Central Coastal Plain Capacity Use Area Regulation, which governs the water resources from Martin County, Burt T. County line, over to Wilson, down through Wayne County, Duplin County, and Onslow County. And in this area, including Onslow County, I want you to know that the state of North Carolina said, you're taking too much water out of the Cretaceous aquifers and you gotta stop. And everybody said, well, wait a minute, what else are we gonna do? We can't just stop. And so they said, okay, we'll come up with a plan called the Central Coastal Plain Capacity Use Area Plan. And it calls for a phased reduction in the amount of water that you're taking in Onslow County out of the deep aquifers called the Cretaceous aquifers. And so if you'll notice this, here's uh, Jacksonville. Jacksonville's right there. And out north of Jacksonville, there's where the Cretaceous aquifer wells are. And so the state comes along and says, you're taking too much, you gotta stop it. And so they came up with, I'm, I'm gonna eliminate the words, okay? The state come up, came up with this concept that I'm gonna show you in graphical form. And they said, okay, if you were all of Onslow County and you were taking eight million gallons of water a day out of the Cretaceous aquifers, that's unacceptable. So starting back in around 2006 or so, they said, we're gonna let you pump eight million gallons a day for six years. And on the first day of August of the sixth year, you've got to reduce by 25%. Now I'm not gonna put anybody in this room on the spot, but what is 25% of eight? Two, says Randy. <laughs> <laughs> so look, so the state said, uh, you have to cut back by two million gallons a day to 75% of what we allowed you to pump when you first started. And then for five years, that's five years right there. They said, keep on pumping at that rate of six million gallons a day. But after five years, you've got to cut back by another 25% of that number. And we know now that that's two. So now we cut back to four million gallons a day. Then we can pump for six more, sorry, five more years at that rate. And we can then reduce one more time. So instead of allowing us to pump eight million gallons a day for a typical county, we're going to end up pumping two million gallons a day. So look, we've already suffered this and we suffer this, and we're thinking about whether or not we have to suffer this next phase reduction. When this happened in the coastal plain, people cried, unfunded mandate. You know, uh, we can't deal with this particular issue, so where are we gonna get the excess, uh, the extra water? If you have to cut back from your use of these particular aquifers. So that's the central coastal plain capacity use area rule, and it has dramatically affected the way you do business here in, in Oslo County. Okay, a uh, quick review. Here's a, a, a photograph of, um, this wonderful county from uh, the New River over to Cap Lejeune, Hubert, down to Dixon, Jacksonville's here, and I think that Richland's would be there, up in there somewhere, and that's about Maysville, would you agree? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's, the, here's, a, here's a, uh, a review. The city of Jacksonville has wells located inside that blue circle, more or less, and they all tap the Cretaceous aquifers. In contrast, the Marine Corps base and wells located inside those purple areas has nothing but Castle Hain wells and they've never tapped the Cretaceous aquifer. So when the state of North Carolina said to Onslow County and Onwasa and Jacksonville, you guys are pumping too much water, you gotta cut back by 75% phased in over a 16 year period, the city of Jacksonville said, <laughs> and, and Onwasa that also has wells out here, they said, okay, fine, we'll just start pumping water from the Castle Hain. And so they did. Today, on Onslow Water and Sewer Authority has a whole series of wells right out here at Hubert. And you can see at 172 and 24, the water treatment plant there, and there's a bunch of wells all out in this area that tap the Castle Hain and supply water to that plant. At the same time, we started developing wells right here at Dixon, and there are wells all the way along this line, all the way down to Holly Ridge, and there are a couple of new wells that we just drilled over here at Holly Ridge, and so all of these wells are in the Castle Hain. So in response to the state's requirement that we cut back on pumping from the deep aquifers, we said, well, let's just pump from the Castle Hain like everybody else. So uh, along comes city of Jacksonville, and the city of Jacksonville says, okay, we got to get out of the Cretaceous, so we'll just drill a bunch of Castle Hain <laughs> wells up in this location. And so that's where we are today. We are in a situation where the state said cut back on the deep aquifer and go to the Castle Hain. 
The Castlehain water smells like the beach water, it smells like rotten eggs, it has a lot of hardness in it, that's from calcium, and it often has iron in it. So you have to build treatment plants at Hubert and at Dixon and out here in uh, north of the city of Jacksonville to treat that Castlehain water. So the cost goes up because you have to treat it. It's not as good as the water from the Cretaceous Aquifer wells. With me? So that's the real story. City of Jacksonville has wells here in the Castlehain, and they still have wells out here in the Cretaceous Aquifer. You guys are great so far. <laughs> but, um, so what do we do? We've, we've suffered this capacity use area, unfunded mandate rule put down from on high at the state level. And so I think that today the single biz, uh, the biggest issue facing Onslow County is how do we meet our current and future demands for our water supply? Uh, uh, you know, the Marine Corps base is really keen on that. You're keen on that because it's our job to make sure that our citizens have plenty of drinking water. I believe that uh, water purveyors in this, uh, in this county, including you and Onwasa and others, including the Marine Corps base, have three main options to deal with our groundwater problems. And I've, I've uh, sort of um, prioritized them in a way that I think is most important, but not maybe as reality. And that is you've got to cooperate with each other. You have wells, Marine Corps base has wells, everybody has wells, we've got to start cooperating. Mm. We have to diversify our resources. We can't put all of our marbles in the Cretaceous basket or in the Castlehane basket. We let, got to learn how to figure out, we got to learn to diversify our development of groundwater resources, and then we have to interconnect. We have to interconnect. In other words, we ought to build connections between the Marine Corps base and the city of Jacksonville, between the city of Jacksonville and Onwasa, between Onwasa and the Marine Corps base. And group, we're doing it. We're doing it. We, uh, through some initiatives uh, spearheaded by Wally and others, we have interconnection be between Onwasa and the Marine Corps base and interconnections between the uh, city of Jacksonville and the Marine Corps base and between Onwasa and the city of Jacksonville. And these interconnections provide us a level of safety in case something happens to one of our, our systems. So those are the three big issues that we're working on, cooperation, diversification, and interconnection. <clears throat> I want to show you what's really going on behind the scenes uh, through uh, this thing called the CPG. And while you have to tell me what the CPG uh, acronym is. Uh, community Planning Group. So this is a big group of people that meet routinely in this county then. They're representatives from Onwasa City of Jacksonville, Marine Corps Base, and others. And we have a subcommittee that's called the Regional Water Resources Group. And we meet pretty routinely, like once a quarter. And we talk about water resource issues in the county. And one of the things that our group decided to do is that we ought to really start to deal with this issue of the Cretaceous wells. Those are the deep wells out north and west of the city of Jacksonville. And so um, because the city of Jacksonville has these Castle Hain wells and the Dixon wells and the Hubert wells are in the Castle Hain and the Marine Corps base is in the Castle Hain, we ought to really figure out what the groundwater system looks like in great detail. That first sketch that I showed you from the coastal plain boundary to out towards the coast is really general and won't help us very much with respect to management of our resources. So the Water Resources Working Group got together over the last almost 10 years, and we said we need to do three things in this county to make sure that we've got enough water supply for the future. We need to build, do what's called a hydrostratigraphic framework study. I'm going to talk to you about it. We need to do a hydraulic model, and we need a monitoring well network because there's a lot we don't know about the groundwater system. So let, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, the bottom two. Uh, a hydraulic model is a model, a computer model, of the plumbing system in the county. You've got pipelines all over this county. You can't interconnect with each other unless you know where the, pump, where the pipes are and how much water can flow into each of those pipes. And so since we've been working on this project, we have completed a hydraulic model, a plumbing model, for all the pipes in the county, the city of Jacksonville, and the Marine Corps base. And so we know now how much water can flow through these pipes, and we know how to interconnect, and we've done that. <clears throat> we've, um, we decided that we would produce this thing called the hydrostratigraphic framework study. And that's a fancy term for let's figure out what the groundwater system really looks like in detail. And we, fin we finished phase one of it, and I'm going to tell you about it now. And at the end of this hydrostratigraphic framework study, we decided that we needed, uh, that was a lot we didn't know, and we needed to put in some monitoring wells. And I'm going to tell you about those monitoring well programs here towards the end. So uh, uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that went into the hydrostratigraphic framework study. And so what we did is we found all the wells I, I hope you can see these little uh, green triangles there. Each of those are wells. These are wells in the county. These are all wells. All of these are the Cretaceous wells out here. So we took each one of these wells and we studied them in, in great detail to see if we could figure out what the groundwater system really looks like. 
And on the basis of about a year of study of all those wells in the county, it's a lot of wells, Randy. <clears throat> How do you study them? We, we get all the records that we can find, and we go to people who operate those wells, and we say, how many gallons a minute does it produce? What's the water quality? How is it screened? How, where are the areas that are, that, are, that are allowing water to come into the wells? <clears throat> the state of North Carolina has a lot of wells mixed in uh, with these particular wells, and they have good records on them. So we spent about a year studying everything we could with respect to the county. And when we were done, we put together a series of drawings that show what the groundwater system looks like in the subsurface. Uh, I'm just going to show you a few of these, if you bear with me, great. So if you were to go to right here uh, in this area west of, <coughs> excuse me, Onslow County, and split the earth right along this line from A to A prime, thank you, Willie, and lift the earth up and look at it from the side. So you're going to see A on the left and A prime on the, on the right. And you can just imagine lifting up the earth and looking at it from the side. <coughs> this is what you see. I, I know it's complicated, and I hope you can see from where you're sitting, but here's the deal. Uh, here's A over here on this side, and A prime, so this would be over all the way to the White Oak River at Swansboro. And if you look down into the subsurface, here's what you see. See, there's that bedrock, the same kinds of rocks that you find over in Raleigh and Durham and Chapel Hill and, and all across the Piedmont. Hard rocks, don't have much water in them. There's the lower Cape Fear Aquifer in this county, the upper Cape Fear Aquifer, the Black Creek, the Beaufort Aquifer, I didn't talk about it, the PD Aquifer. And then here's the Castlehain Aquifer, and we finally figured out that there are multiple parts of the Castlehain Aquifer. I don't expect you to get all this in this talk. I'm going to try to just make a few major points. Along this line of section, which was, Wally, can I go backwards? Yes. <clears throat> Along this line of section, <clears throat> right here, we go right through the Cretaceous Wells, the deep wells north and west of the city. And so <clears throat> what I've done is I've shown those deep wells as vertical lines. So uh, I'd ask you to help me understand which aquifers are producing the water for the city of Jacksonville? Black Creek. Black Creek Aquifer. It's mostly the Black Creek Aquifer, <clears throat> and it's underlain by the Upper Cape Fear Aquifer. So in that area of the county, uh, we are tapping the deep parts of the groundwater system, 500 feet below sea level, 100 feet above sea level, 600 foot deep wells, and we're bringing that water up to the surface, and that's what you're drinking in that area. Can I get a clarification for our audience for a second? Yes, thank you. We're not the only ones tapping the Black Creek. The, uh, the Black Creek is, uh, you mean in this county? Uh, in the state. Oh. I, uh, the Black Creek is larger than the county, and other people are drawing from it. City of Greenville, uh, the city of Greenville from 19, about 1950 to about 2010 relied almost entirely on the Black Creek. The city of Kenston re re relied on the Black Creek. Since that time, they've said, in response to the capacity use area, we're through with the groundwater system, we're going to take water out of our rivers. So today, the city of Greenville drinks entirely river water. The city of Kenston drinks entirely river water. So they've reduced their reliance by going to surface water bodies. Uh, we don't have that luxury in Onslow County, although the new river ha has some potential. It doesn't have the flow of the Tar River and the Noose River, so we're going to continue to rely on groundwater. But your point is well taken. It's a regional aquifer system extending all across the coastal plain. So we're not the only ones drawing down on it. Uh, Still. You're, you're one of three major groups that were drawing down heavily on the Black Creek aquifer from the 60s to the, around 2000 or so. And that would be Greenville, Kenston, down to Jacksonville. A, a, a good point. Thank you. And the, the lower... Aquifers are just too expensive to get to, to, to get yeah, water? Or? They're, they're, they're salty. I'm oh. going to show you today that we figured out that they're salty recently. Oh. And that we, we had a suspicion they were salty, but we didn't have any wells down there because uh, the Cretaceous wells that they drilled north and west of Jacksonville produced really high-quality water, and it wasn't salty. Oh, wow. And the Castlehane wells in this county have never produced any salty water, and it's a tremendous amount of water in the Castlehane. So we've not experienced any saltwater intrusion to speak of, but the state's real concerned about it. Okay. And they didn't have to drill any deeper because they were getting good quality water. They yes. kept, kept that other aquifer a mystery. That's right. Exactly right. And so, and it's deep and it's expensive to drill to those kinds of depths. But I'm going to show you in a few minutes that we've done it. We've drilled on down to those deep zones. And didn't you also say that the Castle Hain water was uh, not up quite and where it had the odor and all to it? Yeah, it tends to be of lower quality. It's certainly treatable and we treat it. We remove the hardness and that's calcium. We removed the hydrogen sulfide smell, that's the rotten egg smell. And we removed silicon and a few other things like iron, 
from the Castle Heme to make it a high quality source of water, both for the city of Jacksonville and on Wilson. And that's why the water treatment plant was so expensive when it was built. Right. Had to remove a lot of different things. Yes, great point. Okay, so moving along, I won't bore you with all these different profiles, but what if I drew one right through the heart of the Marine Corps base, right there over across the, new, the uh, White Oak River? Um, <clears throat> what would it look like? Well, it would be a little bit different, especially with respect to who's utilizing it. So notice all the wells now. All the wells on the Marine Corps base, both, both west of the New River and east of the New River, are tapping which aquifer system? They're all tapping the Castle Hain. But the Castle Hain has lots of different units. There's the one that we call the Comfort Member, and one called the Spring Garden Member, and one called the River Bend Member. And so uh, to date, most people have been tapping this thing called the Spring Garden Aquifer all across the Marine Corps base. And these wells are pretty shallow. They're only about 150 feet or so uh, in depth. And they're the ones that are, that are tapping that rock that I showed you called the Castle Hain Limestone. That's great. All right, so far? So please, please ask questions as we go along. I guess I'll show you one more right along the coast, and that's, uh, that's C, uh, C to C prime starting there. And so we see that in geological cross-section. It's kind of the same story. Um, we know a lot about the names of the aquifers now from all that studying that we did for a year, and we were able to see the differences, and the differences in dip or inclination of these layers. As a general rule, the, uh, the layers get deeper towards Carteret County and get shallower towards Wilmington. And that's because Wilmington is sitting on a thing called the Cape Fear Arch. And that's a high spot in the coastal plain. And all the geological layers are inclined away from that feature off towards the north. So let's see. Maybe I'll just do one more. So if I were to uh, look at the earth from D up here back towards the coast in this direction and lift the earth up and look at it from the side, the layers would look flat because uh, they're dipping in uh, the, a 90 degree angle to this particular orientation. But once again, notice this. If you pass right through Dixon, the Onwasa well field, all the wells would tap the <laughs> Castlehain aquifer system and not the Cretaceous aquifer system. All right, so I've, I've worn you out with that. So when we finished the hydrostratigraphic framework study uh, a few years ago, uh, we made recommendations because we understand that the pictures that I've just shown you are our geological interpretations of what's in the subsurface, and we could be wrong. And we didn't have enough wells to understand every area of the county, so we said, as a group, let's design a monitoring well network for Onslow County that will be the envy of the entire state, because there's no other place in the state where we know as much about the groundwater system as we do at this, even at this time. And so we developed a monitoring well network, and that monitoring well network is shown on this diagram with a series of red dots and numbers. So here's what we said. We need to put in a, we need to put in a series of wells here and here and here at right angles to the coast. And these monitoring wells will be set at different depths so we can really figure out and understand what's going on at depth. And we need to put some monitoring wells right through the Marine Corps base and right up through uh, Burton Park. I know you, all you guys know where Burton Park is. And right on out towards the north. And we need to put in some more monitoring wells along a general north, or northwest southeast line at this location. That's a bunch of wells that'll, that'll cost us over a couple million dollars to put in. We're going to pay for that. Uh, it, it hasn't been done yet. And so we're phasing it in. But uh, uh, Wally would be better to talk about who pays for that than me <laughs> later on. Um, I like to do the work, and I like for, for Wally to pay. And so uh, we, we've only put in a few of these wells so far. But the general answer to your question is that the Marines have said, we'll cover the cost of these monitoring wells on the Marine Corps base, and people will cooperate outside the base and come up with the funding through grants and matching grants and so forth to put in the wells outside the base. Quick question. You've got those three lines coming down. How come you've ignored that one section between the green and the blue line? Uh, in this area right here, we have mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of data. I appreciate the question. We have a tremendous amount of data because the city of Jacksonville wells are there, and there are a lot of other wells in that location, and we felt like we had a pretty, pretty good knowledge, and the state of North Carolina has some wells in there okay. that helped us understand the groundwater system. Okay. I would put wells every one square mile if I could recommend them, but the reality if is... money was no object. Yeah, money yeah. was no object. Yeah. So, what are the wells for uh, the state and the county for? The, Go ahead. For monitoring. They're just monitoring. Yeah, they, monitoring. they do a tremendous job at the Division of Water Resources and the U.S. Geological Survey of putting in wells to monitor uh, specific things like whether or not saltwater intrusion is occurring. So, 
How does a well actually monitor the level? I mean, how does it tell you? So, I mean, so uh, remember that first sketch that I showed you? When you tap this deep aquifer, the water level rises up to a certain level, and that's called a potentiometric surface. Mm -hmm. So we have little devices that can be done electronically or by hand, and we can measure the distance from the land surface down to that water level. And we just do it routinely. We just constantly measure how far it is down to that water level in that well. And we do it in wells that don't have pumps in them, so we're not pumping them, so they're called monitoring wells. You can even go online, and there's websites that will show you for the wells uh, in the coastal plain here. Absolutely. And you can click on the dot, and it'll tell you uh, what the water level is in that well at that from the last reading. Yep. So we have long-term records, and I'm going to show you a few in a couple minutes. So I think the question records. that our viewers might have is, wouldn't that distort your... Uh, understanding of the aquifer if you're not going down and finding the water at where it would normally be because the pressure is pushing it up and you're measuring from the surface to where that level is but it actually the aquifer is another 100 200 feet down yeah but you got to remember that this is the height to which water would rise in the confined aquifer I, I'll give you an analogy all around the city of Jacksonville <coughs> you have elevated storage tanks there are these big tanks sticking up in the air. I call them aerial hydrospheres, but they're, they're uh, elevated water tanks. Well, the water is pumped up into those elevated storage tanks by pumps from wells in this area after they've been, the water's been treated. So if you were to walk outside this building and look up at the, in the sky and imagine the water level in that tank extended outward across the area of the city of Jacksonville, that's the height to which water will rise if you tap the water main that underlies the city because the water main is tied into that elevated storage tank. And so it's this theoretical surface. It's the height to which water will rise if you tap this deeply buried aquifer. So we say the water has the potential to rise to that height and it's the potentiometric surface. So as hydrogeologists, we're real interested in knowing the height to which water will rise in these artesian aquifers that underlie this area. I don't know if that's an adequate explanation. Well, the question I think most people would have is, understanding that you're going to measure the potential, but how do you know where the aquifer would be if you hadn't punctured the bag? Well, because we've, um, we've designed these wells to have openings down there that only let water come into that well at a certain depth. And we call that the screened interval for the well. So uh, one of uh, these, these individual wells that I'm talking about installing out here, uh, some of them might be 100 feet deep, some of them might be 500 feet deep. So we're measuring the pressure at different depths below the land surface through this monitoring well program. Right. I'm, I'm really enjoying these questions, so thank you. I really, really appreciate it. So um, for reasons which I'm going to explain to you in a few minutes, we decided that we needed to prioritize the wells because we didn't have a couple million dollars right now. And so we said, what's the most critical thing that we can do to study the groundwater system to help make sure that we have plenty of water for the citizens of Onslow County. And we all agreed as a working group that we should put some wells at, the, at what we call the Burton Park site. And we have done that work, it's completed. We then prioritize with respect to all these other wells, which sites we would drill next. And when we get some money, we're gonna drill this site because we're worried about saltwater intrusion close to the coast. And then we're gonna drill this site for the same reason we're worried about saltwater intrusion and we're hoping the Marines will put their own well down here, monitoring wells, to measure the potential for saltwater intrusion. And so we prioritize the next sequence of wells. So we want to put some wells there, and we want to come in and put some more wells at Burton Park, and we want to put some wells down in the Dixon area. And with what you were mentioning about the, the ones near Swansboro and down near um, Sneeds Ferry, we have had people put in irrigation wells uh, for watering their gardens and plants that then had issues with their plants and when you know trying to figure out what was going on they had uh they did not have their water tested and when they did they found out it was salty yeah, so, so they were having salt issues with their plants because of those wells so we know about where the salt water problem is in this area but not exactly and that's why we wanted this monitoring well we really don't know where it is here but remember there's hubert and uh, he was producing three four million gallons of water a day to supply that area of the county so we really need to know whether those wells are in jeopardy or not were those two places you've got circled there on the next funding phase and then the, where are they located at in Onslow County? Well, I'll erase this. And I'll yeah, well, you just, yeah, the ones you just erased. So uh, the first one is Burton Park. There's one at okay, Burton yeah, Park. Okay, yeah, I understand that one, but the two down by the coast for the salt water. This one right here? Yeah, um, that's one. So 
Um, I think this is actually at a school. Yeah, I think it's Sandy. It's Sand in the vicinity of Sand Ridge Elementary School. So we want to try Hubert. to put them on government property if we can to save sure. money. Sure. Yeah. Okay. How about the bottom one down there? That's you, that one? one right there. Yeah. That's down towards. Um, I see Dixon it's, is right there, and there's a, how uh, it's a road that comes over like this from Dixon. You know where the new library have is you, on two ten. Have you tested that for it's salt in that water? Area. Gotcha. No, th this well has not been installed yet. And this well has not been installed yet. Do you know where the elevated tank is down there? Yes, sir. Now, they've got intrusion there on salt yeah. water. That's why I'm saying we, we really want this one to, to nail that down because I actually drilled that well with the, I supervised the drilling of that well at the elevated tank, and mm -hmm. indeed we found salt water there. And remember, the Dixon wells, all the Dixon wells are there really close to the salt water, so they're real Because I know we, uh, I'm on the Nwasip advisory board also and several years ago they had detected some salt water at that uh elevated tank right there by the marine corps base correct correct i just wondered if it had gotten any worse or i haven't heard anything about i don't it. think there's been any recent testing on it and we're counting on getting these wells in so we can do a better job of figuring out right. exactly where the boundary between salt and fresh water is okay Would you, if i could interrupt one more yeah time. absolutely uh realizing where you said these wells are going are there uh, any relationship to a similar program either in Pender or Carteret County? Uh, well, so um, th this program that uh, the city of Jacksonville and Nonwasa and the Marine Corps base have put together, I think is a model for other areas. Uh, Carteret County got wind of it. And so they started, they actually came to a couple of our meetings and sent representatives because they wanted to do the same thing. Because I got to tell you, right here at Emerald Isle, right there, the west end of Emerald Isle, uh, several of their wells have gone very salty. And so they had no choice but to either stop pumping them or to treat the water. So they built a reverse osmosis plant right there on Coast Guard Road. Mm -hmm. And they're treating the water from those salty wells that were fresh 25 years ago and taking the salt out of the water. They're dumping the salt into the estuary right there and then distributing that fresh water coming out of the RO plant. And so there are other people looking at what you're doing here in the county, but they've not been successful at putting in together any kind of su successful so there's program. No, and the reason I ask the question is, let's say the one uh, at uh, off uh, 210 there, there's no relationship to one that's in Pender County to get a distance uh, and map out that. So right now, this is the only monitoring system in the coastal point. Uh, there, uh, the state has a few monitoring well systems and the U.S. Geological Survey has a few monitoring wells in their system, but there is no systematic study anywhere in the coastal plain that rivals what we're trying to do here. Doesn't well, they exist. will have to coordinate with us later. So their wells oh. aren't so close together, too close or too far apart. They who? The state? The other, other counties. counties. Yes, counties. we certainly hope that the surrounding counties will, will <clears throat> pay attention, but it's a really great point you make, Thomas, because uh, at every one of our meetings, this was true at our meeting today, the Division of Water Resources representatives participate with us. They're absolutely on board with the location of all these monitoring wells. They plan to take over the monitoring of these wells after we install them and make it part of their larger network. And they have promised to house all the data that we and they collect over the next countless years and keep it on their website, which is an impressive website. I think you mentioned it. And so we have a great, phenomenal working relationship with the uh, Division of Water Resources, who's responsible for permitting all the wells in this area, who was also responsible for telling us we had to stop pumping from the Cretaceous aquifers. One question for you. Jones County, where do they draw their water out of? <clears throat> um, Jones County is uh, this county right here. And right. Jones County um, has just recently put in two new wells near the Craven County, Jones County line right off this map in the, in the Castle Hain system. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, those are two new wells that, that are going to supply water up towards the, uh, the, the northern part of Jones County. So, but there's, there are, to the best of my knowledge, a few Cretaceous wells also in Jones right. County. So they're not solely in the Castle Hain. Jones isn't near as populated as we are, though, is Correct. it? It's Correct. A, it's yeah. a small Absolutely. county. Absolutely. Yeah, the biggest what, town is what? Trenton. 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 Mm -hmm. And then yeah. maybe Maysville next. I mean, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, awesome question. It makes me happy. So, um, <laughs> so these, these, these are what we're going to do next. And we, remember, we've done this one up here that we call um, Burton Park. 
And I'm going to tell you about it now because it has real significance to you here in the county. And we hope to do this one and this one in the, in the near future. And the Marine Corps base is really trying hard to get theirs installed with their own funding. So um, here is an aerial photograph of the area north and west of Jacksonville in the vicinity of Burton Park. And this highway right here is the, I call it the Richlands Highway. It's 258. That's right. And this is the Burton Park area right here. These yellow dots starting right there and there, there, see them, this one? These are wells owned by the city of Jacksonville that tap the Cretaceous aquifers. They're your Cretaceous aquifer wells. So the state of North Carolina has recently said to us, um, this draconian measure that they put forward that said you must cut back by 75% may not be required if you could prove to us that your groundwater system is not in really bad shape in response to pumping these wells. And so we said, well, what are you telling us, Division of Water Resources? And they laid out very specifically a set of guidelines that we could uh, evaluate to answer the question, do we need to continue suffering more and more reductions in the amount of water we take out of the Cretaceous aquifers? And they helped us select this site right here called the Burton Park site. It's in the industrial park. And somehow we ended up with some property and we were able to put some wells on it. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with a, a lot again, but remember, 75% reduction phased in. We're in here. What if we didn't have to suffer another 2 million gallon a day reduction? That would be a real significant thing for you here in the county. 2 million gallons a day is a lot of water. What if the state was overzealous and we could actually go back to right here and pump 6 million gallons of water? So the state said, let's develop some guidelines, because we, we pounded them to death, said, make sure we understand the groundwater system. How will we do it? And so I'm, I'll just show you a little bit of verbiage here, and I apologize for that. But they said, you guys can get an amended permit. And they developed a set of requirements that you should have to achieve. And so we said, okay, well, give us the details. And the details are these. If you can put a well in at Burton Park and show us that the static non-pumping water levels are level, that is, the water levels aren't falling anymore, then we'd be happy. And they said, in, uh, and this is a state map, they said down here in Onslow County, right in there, the water levels are basically not falling in most wells, but they're falling in a few wells. See it, positive trends, negative trends? Mm -hmm. And so they're saying in some of your wells they're falling and some of your wells they're not falling. So we said, okay, maybe if we come over here and put a well right there and monitor it, we can figure out whether they're positive or negative. So the state then said, the pump intakes, where are the pumps down inside those wells? They have to be above the top of the shallowest Cretaceous aquifer that you're using. And so I, we asked the question, okay, what about Onslow County? So here we go. The state said for Onslow County, they're your Cretaceous wells. <clears throat> All the pump intakes are above the top of the aquifer. That's good, because we meet that criteria. And then they said, the present day pumping water levels must be above the top of the shallowest Cretaceous aquifer. So we asked the question, well, what's going on there? All of the wells in Onslow County have pumping water levels. That's when you turn the pump on. How much does the water level drop? All of them are above the top of the aquifer. That's a good thing for us. So it said we might not have to suffer the next phase reduction. How, uh, is, you're saying is above the level of the aquifer. Are you saying the bottom no, part the top, or the top? top. So we're not allowed in this state to pump the water level down below the top of the aquifer. The actual confining rock layer. That's right. That's exactly right. In the so well. In the well itself. In the well. In the well. In the so well you're itself. dependent totally on the pressure to bring it to you. That's right. So the pressure is bringing the water level way up above the top of the aquifer, and the state is saying you can pump it, but you can't lower the water level below the top of the aquifer in that well. And, and, and so and by, by the top of the aquifer, the top of the actual rock formation from which you are pumping. That's right. With and, the water and, being up above. And we know exactly where that is because we did that detailed study that I showed you early, early on. May Mark. I get your opinion on something that you're talking about here? Is the improvement or the perceived not threat being lessened because the two other cities got out of the uh, Black Creek or because more water is flowing into it than was anticipated? <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> so, so, so city, city of Greenville doesn't pump water anymore. City of Kinston doesn't pump any water. But my opinion has had no impact on what's going on way down here in Onslow County. So Onslow County water levels, I'm going to show you in a few minutes, aren't falling anymore because you suffered a phase reduction. 
you, the state has said cut back by 75 percent. You've been cutting back on the amount of water that you're pumping out of these aquifers, and we're reaching a balance between the amount of water that's coming into the aquifer and the amount of water that's going out of the aquifer by well pumping. And we couldn't determine that before because we weren't smart enough to know what that balance would be as to what was coming in. Um, I'm not going to comment on whether you're smart enough or not, but um, <laughs> you were pumping more water out of the aquifer than is going into the aquifer. But the state couldn't tell you what was They couldn't going tell out. us what that they, exact they balance were, was. Yeah, they, so, were, they did their best guess estimate. And, and if you think about it, it's a really a, a intelligent concept. Uh, we can't tell you what the number is, so let's see if we can achieve it in a systematic pattern. And so re remember, in that stepwise reduction, there's a five-year framework. And so the state said, during that five years, we're going to evaluate the aquifer system and see if water levels have stabilized, to see if water levels are coming back up and so forth. And we held their feet to the fire on that issue, and so they wrote these rules that said, here's how we're going to evaluate whether or not the groundwater system is in jeopardy. So, but then they, turned, then they came along, and here's the kicker for Onslow County. They said, if applicable, chloride concentrations, that's salt, obtained from monitoring wells or unused production wells, screened or gravel packed in the Cretaceous aquifer, have to be less than 250 milligrams per liter. And that is the boundary that we hydrogeologists say is the boundary between fresh and salt water is 250 parts per million. Now you can, it'll be, it would taste really salty to you as a human being at 250 parts per million. So, um, uh, this, this whole paragraph simply says, um, tell us what you've learned and you can apply for no further phase reductions at Burton Park. I can't tell you how important that would be to you if, you did, if we didn't have to lose two more million or we could gain two million back. So here's what we did at Burton Park. We went out and we studied this thing to death. We drilled a bunch of holes and we drilled one at this location to uh, 400 or so feet below the land surface and we let the water come in right there and this whole thing from right here to right here is the Black Creek Aquifer. We moved over 20 feet and we drilled another well right here all the way down to there. And we just let the water come in right there and that's in the deeper part of the Black Creek. And then we drilled a third well right next to it and we let the water come in right there and that's the upper Cape Fear Aquifer. And then we measured the water levels in each one of those wells. And the water levels in the Black Creek Aquifer, that's what you're pumping water out of. It's right there where that triangle is, see it? So the aquifer is way down here but the water will rise all the way to right there because it's an artesian aquifer. And the water level deeper in that aquifer, if we let the water come in here, the pressure there is such that the water level would rise to right there. So the Black Creek aquifer has a consistent water level. But the deeper aquifer has a water level way up here. And that's because we aren't using it. So its water level has not been depressed by pumping. You with me? All right. So. Uh, I'm going to skip over this because this is what geologists do. We go in and we drill wells in the ground and then we run these electronic devices and we get all these really cool squiggly lines over here and they tell us something. <laughs> and what they tell us is where the aquifers are and where they aren't. And so that's how we chose how to put the wells in and chose the different aquifer systems by learning a lot about groundwater using electronic devices in holes in the ground. All right, so if you go to Burton Park today, this is what you'll see. At Burton Park, there are uh, there's an upper Cape Fear aquifer well, a lower Black Creek well, and an upper Black Creek well. And <clears throat> we have figured out the following things about these wells. The water level in that well is at that triangle, and it has 5,700 milligrams per liter chlorides. It's really salty at that location. This well has a water level at that blue triangle, which is right there. Can you see the triangle? I guess you can. All right, that, great. And so how much salt is in the water? 880 milligrams per liter. Three times, four, almost three times the amount of salt allowed by the state to sell the water to the public. And this well has a static water level right there at the blue triangle, and the chlorides are only 42 parts per million. It's fresh. And so the, the people have known what they're doing here in the county. They're really smart. They've been putting Cretaceous wells in for the last 40 years that tap the, the fresh portions of the groundwater system. But what would you say about the deeper parts of the groundwater system? It's salty at this location. And so what this has allowed us to do is to say, well, where is the boundary between fresh water <coughs> and salty water in the groundwater system at Burton Park? And so we figured it out that this is the saltwater portion where it's green, and this is the freshwater portion, at least at this one location in Oslo County. Well, and so... 
Um, if we go to the regional scale, and if this is about Burton Park right here in this cross-sectional view, we now know that the boundary between saltwater and freshwater, this is salty and this is fresh, at least at this one location is there. But we don't know where it is everywhere else. And that's why we want to put in monitoring wells. So I'm almost done. I know, I know I'm running out of time, right? You, you so have I'm time. Good. Thank you. So, um, You're out of time when there's no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is better than my freshman geology class. It, it's so, not like a classroom. We're not all going to get up and run, run away yeah, on you. Exactly. I don't have to wake you up. So, um, so look, uh, so we think there's salt water in the aquifer right here, and we think there's fresh water in the aquifer there, but we don't know where it is elsewhere. So uh, I'm going to skip that slide. Here's what the state's requiring us to do. The state said monitor for an entire year the chlorides in this well, all of these wells, and submit the data to the state. So here is the data for the upper Black Creek aquifer chlorides. I'm not going to talk about total dissolved solids. I'm just going to talk about salt. In the upper Black Creek well, all throughout the year, these are the numbers. There was about 42 parts per million, and I don't think that number is correct. Uh, it has a lab error. And by the end of the year, the, water, the chlorides were only 72 parts per million. And so would you argue that that's a significant increase in chlorides? There is some increase, but is it significant? That's the question we're trying to get a handle on. So we did this for all three wells. Here's the lower Black Creek aquifer, lower Black Creek aquifer chlorides, and the chlorides are this number. That is a bad number and from the lab again. So what would you say about the chlorides in that aquifer? Kind of staying around 800 to 900. Don't see a substantial increase. And finally, here's that upper Cape Fear aquifer well, and the chlorides are shown in red, and they're hovering around five or 6,000 and haven't shown a substantial increase. And I don't believe this number is correct, and I know this number is not correct. And so the state has said, um, okay, uh, you don't have to suffer the next phase reduction in this county for the Cretaceous aquifers if the water levels aren't falling. So <clears throat> we measure the water level in the well for a whole year. And in the upper Cape Fear aquifer, that's the deep one, though it's the water level right there. It's 2018 feet above sea level. But in the two aquifers called the Black Creek, the two portions of the Black Creek aquifer, what would you say about the water levels? <coughs> they're pretty consistent, and they're also down there about 70 feet because that's, that's because you're pumping a lot of water out of that aquifer. It's lowered the water level. So here's the, here's the moral of the story, I think. The state said if the water levels aren't declining, you don't have to suffer phase reduction. If the water levels are above the top of the aquifer, you don't have to suffer a phase reduction. And if the water levels, or sorry, if the pumps in the wells are above the uh, uh, top of the aquifer, you don't have to suffer a, a phase reduction. But if the chlorides are increasing in the vicinity of your wells, that's a bad issue, and they're going to make you continue to suffer the next phase reduction. So the fundamental question that we're asking is, in the aquifer that's being pumped by the city of Jacksonville and Onwasa, are chlorides increasing? Clearly they are. But is that a problem or not? There's, there's an increase and there's an adverse in, increase. So we're, we'll have to make the argument to the state in the next few weeks about these data. They heard this talk today and they know what's going on. We'll make the argument, in my opinion, that we can continue to pump water from the groundwater system in Onslow County without suffering the next phase reduction. Is that slowly growing uh, going up because of salt water penetrating yeah it could be yeah it absolutely could be it could be a slow migration of chlorides towards the well field but that's not a significant increase in chlorides from around 40 or 50 to about 72 but you have to say that it's increasing so the question is is that an adverse impact and should we reduce our withdrawals from the cretaceous aquifers or could we ask the state let us continue to pump at this rate and monitor for a few more years and see what happens question is the uh, infiltration of the salt it comes from the ocean side to the land side can it be reversed by reducing the drawdown yes so the hydrostatic pressure would push it back to the ocean if it, there was more water in there sure if you stop pumping water from the cretaceous aquifers the salt water interface would stop moving and it, it actually might actually move back towards the ocean at a real slow pace it's not going to move fast in any, in any no. sense. But the lower aquifer, which has not been touched, it's got a higher salt content. Absolutely. But so the, that hydrostatic didn't push it back. 
Well, the deeper aquifer, let's see, right here, let me get rid of these. Uh, I'm just wondering if the argument is uh, by the state it holds water in the so sense speak, yeah. that, in that if you get out of the aquifer uh, because its salt is increasing, will that getting out and reducing your usage put more water in the aquifer at whatever level push the salt? Clearly, clearly. Very what, back. what the state wants us to do is if salt water is impinging upon this well field, they want you to cut back. But they they don't know that it will push it back, and it will be they, very slow probably. They're absolutely convinced, that, as am I, that if you reduce the pumping rate from these wells, the saltwater interface will move back towards the coast, without a doubt. You just don't, but, know, you just don't know how quickly it'll move back. Right. right. But we've been pumping since the 1960s or so in this county, and this is the, this is the, this is the a mile away from your well field, the chlorides are still only 70 parts per million, and you as a human couldn't taste it. So to me, the data suggests a continued uh, opportunity to pump the same amount of water we're pumping out of the Cretaceous aquifers now, and let's monitor it continually. And the state rule says, just because we tell you you don't have to suffer the next phase reduction doesn't mean we can't change our mind later on if chlorides indeed start to increase. But and so, in a way, the state is trying to protect everybody because what they're trying to make sure is we don't have worse saltwater intrusion. Not only that, it's an excellent point. Not only that, but they want us to be prepared for what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Saltwater intrusion is not the worst thing that could happen to this county. Uh, we, we take salt out of the water in Pasco Tank County, mm -hmm. uh, Ocracoke, um, Dare. Dare County, mm -hmm. thank you, um, and uh, on the west end of Emerald Isle. Uh, we've been taking salt out of water forever. Yeah. Uh, it's not forever, but for a long time. And so it's not the worst thing that can happen, but we don't want that to happen right. if we can prevent it. And so right. if we're cutting back prolongs the life of the Cretaceous aquifers, that's what we should do. Because okay. in the meantime, we want to grow, too. And we don't want to pay for what it takes to take the salt no, out of the water. Desalinization yeah. is, it's, it's more expensive. is expensive. And, and you yes. deal with a byproduct. If you take the salt mm -hmm. out of the water, it just doesn't go away. You've got to discharge it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you quickly, if you go across the Emerald Isle Bridge from um, Cape Carteret to Emerald Isle, mm -hmm. just as you are, enter the little causeway at the bottom of the bridge on the Emerald Isle side, there are three buoys sitting out there on your left. Have you ever seen them? Mm -hmm. And there's always water bub bubbling up there. That's the salt water coming out of the reverse osmosis plant on Coast Guard Road. Mm -hmm. it, because um, these reverse osmosis plants are 80-20 plants, more or less. 80% uh, um, uh, fresh water, 20% brine. So if you put 10 gallons through the plant, you get 8 gallons of fresh water, 2 gallons of really salty water. you got to put that water somewhere, so that's where we put it. If so, I could go back to a minute so that our audience uh, watching on TV has an appreciation. If we don't have to take that reduction, then production of water will be less expensive for the city to produce, and the water rates won't go up. So it's, it's, a, it's a significant step if we can avoid having to get further out of the Black Creek, because we don't cost as much to process the Black Creek water as it does the Castle Hain. And so if we can save that 2 million gallons a day, that means we won't have to pass that cost of processing it on in the water bill. That is a true statement. It costs us less to treat water out of the Black Creek because essentially all we do is chlorinate it mm -hmm. than it does to take water from the Castle Hain and then treat it through our water treatment plant and send it out to our citizens. And then it would cost even more if you were having to take the salt out of it as well as having to that take out correct. the iron and, and the sulfur. And and our current and plant it. would not handle that. It, it, it would to take change the, upgrades, right. yes. The and Emerald rates. Isle has a salt water body to dump it into. Where would we put it? You'd, you'd, we'd, you'd probably have to put it, uh, and this has never happened in North Carolina except at one location, you have to put it in the ocean. Yep. Heaven forbid we put salt water in the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but there's a third aspect of your excellent question there, Thomas, uh, and that is if, if we have to continue our uh, reducing our reliance on the Cretaceous aquifers, then we have to increase our reliance on the Castle Hain. Mm -hmm. As more and more people go to the Castle Hain, it puts uh, pressure, pressure on the Castle Hain and can cause salt water intrusion problems in the Castle Hain. And that's why we're so interested as a water resources group at completing this monitoring well network because we want these wells down here and we want these wells down here and down here to figure out what's going on within the Castle Hain and other aquifers in the event that we have to increase our reliance on those aquifers if the state says no to the reductions, to the to no further reductions. And can I pause you there for just a Thank moment? You. Yep. 
And if you'll remember, I updated, I briefed the committee, and we actually went to council at the beginning of this year, if you go back one slide okay. for me, um, for we received um, money from the Military Affairs Commission of North Carolina for grant funding, and that was for this well, this well, can you circle that one for me? And then the, the Castle Hay, the addition of a Castle Hay monitoring well at Burton Park. And the plan there is we received $134,000 from the Military Affairs Commission. The city and Omwasa are going to partner together to split the cost, the remaining cost of that project. On average, what it costs so, you to put a monitoring well in? And I know it matters well, how deep it is, but give does. me an average. I think we've estimated that project at around $400,000. How give much or take. per well? Um, uh, I'll let you answer that one. 30000 20000 for a well into the Castle Hain and over 100000 for a well into the deep aquifer. Okay. So we're not going to have many deep aquifer wells. Okay. That's really expensive. The, and that's why we moved forward with the one at Burton Park so quickly because although putting in three deep monitoring wells at that location is expensive, if we can, for the city of Jacksonville, the next reduction which, by the way, is August 1st of 2018, so we're in that year, would mean that we would lose another million gallons of capacity. So that would be the city of Jacksonville, August 1st, will lose a million gallons of capacity from the Black Creek. So, and as Dr. Sproul said, the city and Omwasa are literally in the same boat. Our Cretaceous Wells are in the same area. So... We both have to look at, you know, we're not in a bubble. We have to work together to figure out what's going on in the Black Creek to see if it's not like they could stay off the next reduction and we would have to take it. We're in the same boat. We either both stay off the next reduction or we both face the next reduction, which puts us more into the Castle Hain. The city for a million gallons, and I don't know what Onwasa's capacity is, but they would be looking for at least the same, maybe more, which, again, in turn, puts pressure on the base, who is solely in the Castle Hain. So As that's the importance of the monitoring wells that we we just talked about at Burton Park. Is Camp Lejeune noticing any impacts on their wells, either with reduced water level, greater cones of depression, salt coming in, anything along those lines? At a couple of locations, they've experienced some issues. For example, I think there's a, a great possibility for saltwater intrusion up, up into these wells when the saltwater wedge moves up into the new river. And so uh, they've ex experienced a few problems, but nothing catastrophic. Their, their wells are doing quite well. Uh, um, one of the interesting aspects, I'll just, just finish up with this, is that we notice that we want to put some Castle Hain wells where we already put the deep wells at Burton Park. And that's because when we drilled the deep wells, we drilled through an unexpectedly thick and wonderful looking section of the Castle Hain. Mm. And it might be a great source of water supply for both on Wasa or the city of Jacksonville in the future. And I'll just leave you with this. Uh, we, we also have figured out that there, there are spots in the Castle Hain that are exceptional in terms of their ability to produce water. For example, do you know the name of the old military base that used to be right there? Camp it's Davis. Camp Davis. Mm -hmm. There are existing wells on Camp Davis since the 1940s that will produce 115 gallons of water a minute and only reduce the water level by one foot. So I don't know if that means anything to you, but here's the story. We just recently came and put two wells right here for Anwasa because of what we learned at that old military base. And those wells will produce 1,200 gallons of water every 60 seconds. Is that in Anwasa? Wow. That's got to be. It is Is that in the Camp Lejeune, yeah. Camp Davis uh, area? No, no sir. We okay. moved out of the Camp Davis area to actually the other side of the highway. I put them on the wrong side of the highway. By the there. state Look game at. land. Yes. Okay. Yep. And those two wells are capable, seriously, of 1,200 gallons of water a minute. That's uh, almost 2 million gallons a day per well. And so we... Uh, throughout this organization have agreed upon the following general philosophy. Let's develop the water resources in Onslow County where they're sustainable, and let's move the water through our pipelines to where it's needed. And if we, if we all adopt that philosophy and really live with it, I think you'll have a sustainable, you'll, I know you'll have a sustainable water supply for the future. 
So that's kind of a synopsis see, of what we've so been So you doing. don't see any time in the foreseeable future, 50 years, let's say, that uh, Onslow County, whether it's the city of Jacksonville or Onwasa or Richlands, need to develop alternate uh, water resources, reverse osmosis or uh, taking water out of a river or, you know. My, my opinion, my answer to your question is if we manage the existing groundwater system intelligently and don't overpump it and be cognizant of where the saltwater freshwater interface is, that the freshwater resources in Onslow County are a long term, -term source, source of water for the citizens of this county. I can't say that we won't go to reverse osmosis at some locations within the county, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. It, it, it's, it's a beautiful system, and the cost of reverse osmosis is not three or four times the cost of standard treatment of fresh water to remove iron, so it's not cost prohibitive. So it, it's not a bleak story at all, and I wouldn't want to leave the citizens of this county thinking that this is a bleak story. Uh, managers in this county are doing a phenomenal job of figuring out what the water resources are and how to manage them properly. And I think there's a, a, a long-term fresh water supply. I'd leave you with this as part of that answer. Uh, there's a quarry right up here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's a quarry, uh, quarry being planned somewhere in here. Where is Holly, where is um, Maple Hill? Is that it's, about it? Yeah, it's generally. Yeah. Okay, about, so look, a um, bit. the Castle Hain, in order to keep the quarry dry here at Onslow Quarry, we have to remove about 10 million gallons of water a day. 10 million. The projections, I did the work here, the projections on how much it will take to keep this quarry dry are about 10 million gallons a day. So uh, we, c we can take this water in the future. Oh, by the way, at Belgrade, there's a big quarry called the Belgrade Quarry, 10 million gallons of water a day. Almost all these limestone quarries, need, we need to pump 10 million to keep them dry. Think about that. There's three rock quarries that produce 10 million gallons of water. That's 30 million gallons of water. That's Where does that water go now? It discharges directly to creeks. Into creeks and, and down just, into the New River? Yep, yes, ma'am. And here, here it goes to the New River. Here it's going to go to some tributaries and go off in this direction. Mm -hmm. And up here it goes to a tributary and ends up in the New. How fresh is that water? Very, very, really, really fresh. Limestone filtered. Yeah. yeah. Is there a reason why the state doesn't require its capture and use the, rather than dumping? Uh, yes. Um, the, the state has an ongoing concern that uh, rock quarries are places where there's a lot of human activity. There's explosives that are used in rock quarries. There are trucks coming in and out of the rock quarries. And so there is the potential that the water inside a rock quarry that they're pumping out could be contaminated by human activity. And so they said, let's don't drink that water. But every mine has a finite life. They'll run out of land after a while. And when that mine is done, that mine will fill with water to above sea level, to within a few feet of the land surface. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, at the Onslow Quarry, located right here, I believe that you can pump 5 million gallons of water a day out of that quarry when the mine is over, mining is over, and the quarry will be half full of water. You can pump 10 million out and, and make it dry. You can pump 5 million out and it's still half full. So that is a long-term supply. And the state has said when the mining is over, you can drink that water. And they're pumping out of those same aquifers, aren't they? It's Castle Hain. Yeah. Yep. And so, but here's what we've done. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but at Onslow Quarry, right here, uh, Onwasa, Onwasa, the Onslow Water and Sewer Authority, has said to the state, okay, you won't let me drink the water out of the quarry, but could I put wells around the quarry? like this, and intercept that water before it gets to the quarry, and the state has said yes. So Onswasa is working with Martin Marietta to develop wells that are being produced as we speak that capture the water before it goes into the mine. The mining company obviously likes that because they don't have to pump that water. So that's a great source of water for us in the future in this county because the limestone, wherever it's close to the surface, is, is a place where mining can take place. And everybody has their opinions about mining, and let's not get into that, but... Uh, mine, mines, existing mines and future mines will be great sources of water for you in this county in the future. Yeah, if you ever see an old quarry, they're all filled with water. Yeah. It just naturally comes up. A lot of people like to live next to them uh, mm -hmm. when the mining's over, not while it's mining. But, you know? All right. Occasionally you hear on the uh, local news that there is a problem with water. Are the counties on either side of us having salt intrusion or... Uh, looking at a future where they're not going to have enough water? Are we going to hear that on the news? Uh, is that something that's going on right now? Yeah, yeah. As I pointed out uh, here in, uh, if I could just uh, erase this, 
Um, right in, oh boy, too much on this slide, hold on. Uh, there's a major issue with saltwater intrusion right here at the west end of Emerald Isle. Uh, saltwater intrusion has already occurred in lots of other places up and down the coast, and we've dealt with it by building reverse osmosis plants. Saltwater intrusion at the southern end of, of uh, Topsail Island is, 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 is known. Wilmington and PD? Uh, Wilmington has both Castlehane and PD, and on Figure 8 Island and, and um, a couple of other places along the intercoastal waterway like this one uh, have suffered some small salt, uh, examples of saltwater intrusion. Wrightsville Beach has had some issues with saltwater intrusion. So the areas really right along the coast, roughly in this area, within a few miles of the coast, are the areas that are most susceptible to saltwater intrusion in the Castlehane aquifer system. And so we really have to be aware of, of that and, and monitor it closely. But what's been happening is that people are simply saying, okay, our wells are salty, let's build a reverse osmosis plant. I don't think that's what we ought to be doing until we have to. We ought to be trying to manage the fresh groundwater system so that it doesn't go salty. But if it does go salty, all is not lost because we do have reverse osmosis. Well, we have to appreciate what uh, the city is doing in Owasa in that it avoids cost, so we have cheaper water. And that should be applauded that our water is less expensive than it would be if we were willy-nilly doing these things ahead of time. It's good investment to keep that cost down for our citizens so that they have the ability to have clean, fresh water without having to pay every penny of their retirement check. When, when this monitoring well network is done, the, the, our yeah, understanding of the groundwater yeah. system in this county will be the envy of everybody in the coastal plain. Nobody is taking this approach. Now, I applaud the efforts of the Water Resources Group, the CPG, and the people who are taking a leadership role to come to understand the level of detail that we now have and will have in the future when this monitoring well network is, becomes a reality. Does this have application in other states, Florida, Virginia, South Carolina? Absolutely, uh, and, and western states as well, you know, because so much of our water law comes from abuses of the groundwater system in places like the High Plains Aquifer of eastern New, Mexico, uh, eastern New Mexico and West Texas. So absolutely, the lessons learned here are in large part of the lessons that people have already suffered elsewhere and vice versa. So, but th this is a phenomenal thing that's going on here in this county to protect the water resources for the future citizens, the future in, of, this, uh, of this county. So, and I appreciate the opportunity to work on it, and I especially appreciate the opportunity to come down and speak with you about it. And your enthusiasm was overwhelming, so thank you. <laughs> but, Wally, could you pass out the exam? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are we good? Are we good? Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. I know you guys Thank have you. other business, and the Marrakesh is calling me. There you go. <laughs> uh, okay. Enjoy gonna, your evening. I'll take my leave. Wife, I'll right? take, my wife is calling. I'll take my leave. Okay. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Come back. I will. Anytime. Seriously. The next item we have is system development fee updates from Wally. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I just wanted to give you, um, I appreciate the members that were able to come to um, the workshop on the 19th, 18th of January. So um, we went over system development fees. We actually had a member of Stantec who is our consultant that's um, working through our um, system development fee analysis and fee calculation. And those were presented to the city council. So. I'll run through those real quickly. I know we've had a long meeting this evening, but just a reminder, system development fees are imposed on new development. They're fees for people or builders, developers tying into our system. So these are not the monthly fees that the right payers would pay. This is basically to offset cost for new development on our water and system, our water and sewer system. Um, and the improvement, improvements that are required by those developments. So there's three methodologies. I know I went over these before, but basically there's a, a buy-in and incremental and a combined method. Stantec, who is, is at our, who is our consultant, recommended to council that we use the combined method. Um, the reason for that is because we have a lot of investment in our existing system and we have a very robust capital improvement plan, as you're very well familiar, familiar with, with your review of it um, each year. And if you'll remember, this year we're going to a 10-year 
capital improvement plan because we can program projects. The law actually requires us to use not less than 10 years and not more than 20 years in the calculation of capital improvement projects. So real quickly, this is how they came up with the calculation. It's the, the fee calculation is basically the value of the utility subtract a credit, and if you'll remember, we talked about that credit. It's the outstanding debt on any um, assets that we have constructed. Good example are our treatment plants. We still have outstanding debt on our treatment plants. So you, you subtract that out, which is called, they call it a credit in the law. This is required per the law. And then you divide that by the system capacity. They did this for both our water and our sewer systems. Um, basically, you can see that the value of our system, our water system, is about $70 million, just over $70 million. Um, the credit is, for this, we have outstanding debt of $17 million. That's primarily related to the construction of a new um, water treatment plant. And our system capacity is 7 million gallons a day. And we, we got that by using... Um, the wells that are available to feed the water treatment plant because while the plant's expandable to 8 million gallons a day, we don't have current well capacity in the Castle Hayne Aquifer, which we just learned a lot about, to supply the uh, water treatment plant. So we have to use it with the wells that we have capacity for currently. And then we add to that, which is about five, and then currently we're permitted to... Um, pull 2 million gallons a day from the Black Creek Aquifer. So that gives us rough, roughly a um, $2,700 or $2,800 EDU. And I think it's important that's equivalent development unit. You know, I think we, we think a lot about stormwater. We think ERU, which is equivalent residential unit. And I'll talk about the equivalent development units in just a minute because I know that question's coming. <laughs> the sewer calculation was done the exact same way. You can see that we have a $140 million uh, sewer system. Our credit, we, we still have outstanding debt of about $50 million in our uh, sewer system. And our capacity is 10 million gallons a day. And I know the first thing you're thinking is our land treatment, <laughs> our land treatment site is only 9 million gallons a day. But we also have one million a gallon, one million gallons per day reserved at the basis treatment uh, facility through Piney Green. Um, so that gives us a total of ten million gallons per day, and that gives us an equivalent development unit of three thousand three hundred sixty-six dollars. Question for you: If you're sure. including the one million gallons from the Marine Corps base but you don't include any of the value or cost of the Marine Corps base portion of the system? Because, I mean, it's like you're pulling in part of it as credit, as, as we can use this, but we have no costs associated with we do, it. We actually oh, do yeah. have costs yeah. associated, and it is figured in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have costs associated with, um, we pay a reservation fee, an annual reservation fee. So that cost is figured in. We, we had the cost for um, constructing popular, popular branch um, pump station and force main. So there, that cost is factored in. And we had some improvement cost in OMWASA's system because we actually transmit through them. So that's all included so that's in the value all of the utility system. included in the value of the system. Thank you. So that's why that $1 million has to be included as part of the um, treatment capacity as well. Because you've taken it in in the credit, too. That's correct. So here's our equivalent development unit compared to, you can see our existing system development fee, formerly known as facilities charges. Water was at 21.19, sewer was at 37.99, and you can see after the, after the new calculation, water is actually higher um, by $680 to almost $2,800. And sewer is actually a little bit lower at $433 less. So that would put us at $3366. So I knew the 
question was coming about equivalent development units. So what we have is a 5 inch, inch meter, and this comes straight from uh, the American Water Works Association, AWWA. 5 eighths meter is basically your one equivalent development unit, and you can see as it goes up by meter size, the factors. So when you get to a one inch meter, you're actually talking about two and a half times, two and a half equi equivalent development units or EDUs. So we just say five eighths would be like one, that would supply one house. That's correct. Although you so, can have a three quarters inch at, if you want. at, at a house. Yeah. 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 I'm what sorry? does it cost you to change a meter? So if you, uh, that's a great question. So if you have a business, um, a good example would be a small retail strip center. If you have a retail store in one of those units and that retail store leaves and you maybe, let's say two units become available and somebody puts in a restaurant. They may have had one or two five-eighths meters supplying those. But if a restaurant goes in, they're likely going to need more water. So they may upgrade the meter from five-eighths to one inch or from five-eighths to one and a half inch. And if they do that, they're required to pay the difference in system development fees. So if they upgrade, they're required to pay the difference in system development fees. And we do track that. How about if you want to go from three quarters down to five eighths? Um, if you're if you are a if you're a business, it's not very likely that you can do that because you there's typically things that drive your meter size. Um, if you're a residence, you may you know if you're a single family residence, you may be able to go from a three quarter to a five eighths. It makes no impact on your system development fee because that is the one time fee you paid to buy in at whatever point your house was built, but it could make a difference on your monthly bill because the monthly bill for a five eighths and a three quarter are different. So if, if you're, it's you not know, much, they only charge like labor. Yes. It's, it's, no, it's not like a big fee, but if no. you have one, you need to, well, see, they made back. me put in a three quarter because of the we square footage, this. right? Yes. So we, we did amend that to yes. make that available to you. If you're willing to accept the, loss of pressure which yeah, that's, that's, that's correct you're ever going to realize yeah, that's as a single individual oh, well, and it, I, it's it's an individual decision no, if, it, i mean it's yeah. but it's 30 dollars or more a month you can say that <laughs> yes i mean okay well it's good for you some people do you know yeah. that's the thing uh, and, and for what it's worth i have a two-story home and it's got a five-eighths meter and you know i may notice it a little bit if i'm taking a shower and my wife decides to wash clothes with the Washing machine, huh. because a washing machine is a is probably one of the largest water users yes. in your home. So, it, it, I'm willing to live with that, but others may not be. <laughs> um, Just so they know, how can people know what size meter they have? If they want to know what size meter they have, they probably need to contact us, and we we can look at their account and tell them. And there is a fee to change it out. It's like fifty dollars to change a meter size. Yeah. I was so, going to say the labor to answer the question. There's the cost of having it changed out, then there's there the cost is. associated with the system development fee, and then there's the cost of on your bill changes according to your meter That's size. That's correct. And the way our system development fee, I know I talked to a commercial business, if you know they go up in meter size, they do have to pay. Right now, the way our system development fee is worded for single family residential, if you would like to go from a five eighths to a three quarters because you're not like me and you're not willing to put up with that momentary loss in pressure when the washing machine kicks in, <laughs> then, you know, you, you can upgrade for that same meter change out fee, but we do not charge additional system development fees because it's by the um, residential unit. So single family is done different than commercial. Is it always been that way? Because it's, I had a, I had a. Friend. It's been that way for the last probably five or six years. Because I remember an instant someone added a garage with like a mother-in-law unit, and we were going to force them to go to the three quarters and charge the fee. But that would be different because it's two dwelling units. Hmm. It went from one dwelling unit to two dwelling units. Oh, okay. What do you and think? It, it depends. It's 
It's based on dwelling units. Okay. Well, so the if you size have is based on fixtures, right? It what used to be. Yes. Say, we went yeah. away from based on fixtures to based on dwelling units. Okay. But you're correct. There is a statement that you signed that you recognize if this has any Im adverse impact to your water pressure or creates a less desirable that you're responsible for another fee to change back. I just have a question just out of curiosity. If you put a bigger meter in and you've got older plumbing, are you going to have problems? <laughs> I don't know. Because <laughs> you've got more pressure, think, right? Yes, but I don't think it's that significant. I can't ever imagine okay. Yeah, you get more flow. Much. I don't believe the no. pressure is. No, I don't. I, think the I don't think it would be significant be enough to worry about. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. Because those pipes are not going to take just so much water anyhow. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I was just time. wondering how much you know would it affect the pressure that much that you'd you know wind up. Only if you go from five eighths to five inches. Yeah, I bet. Okay. So here's your equivalent development units. And then, so here's the calculated fees by meter size. Um, so a 5 eighths is essentially equivalent to a, a residential yeah. unit. So you can see that the new calculated fees go up about $680. Um, now, what I'll remind the board is this is a maximum supportable amount. Mm -hmm. So this is the maximum you could charge. You, the council could make policy decision to charge less than this for a reason if they would like to. <laughs> However, that's where, it, that's where the discussion of balancing having growth pay for itself comes in. Why is a percentage, like five-eighths, it only went up a certain percent, but four-inch almost over doubled? It goes back to this calculation they did here. It. Oh. It's based on the equivalent development unit, so that factor increases. And our old system development fee was not enti tied entirely to these equivalent units. Okay. So, and this is this is more of the um, standardization that's come out since we originally adopted our. And this fees. is the way that the water, the National Water Council does it. Yes. Okay. And who would use a four inch? Um, so, uh, maybe so, a, a hotel or or something like that. You, it would be a something car large. wash. The hospital's got a six inch. Okay. And what does a car so, wash have? Probably a two, if I had to guess. Um, but they don't have to have large meters because <coughs> they are required to recycle a lot of their water. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah, so they may even be smaller. I would have to check. Okay. And we have problems at Sam's Club with a meter. Didn't they have a large meter and it was over? That one, uh, what you remember at Sam's Club was actually their um, backflow device, I think, blew out. Was their, I thought it was their sprinkler system is not metered. And it was something blew out. Yeah, it was right at the backflow device, but it, okay. and it was going to their pond. Right. Yeah, but it wasn't it was, metered, so they didn't get a real high water. Yeah, it was like nine hundred thousand gallons yeah. or yeah. something. Yeah. Wasn't it? That was going I'd, I'd out like to make a point to the board here that I think is fairly significant and kind of gets glossed over. This using a five eighths as a basis, and then coming up with it costs this much for the uh, water and this much for the um, sewer is not a theoretical thing. This is saying this is what the cost is. You're getting into this. This is what it costs. So when you say that you want to charge somebody $40,000 for a four inch, that's what it costs for us to have that capacity either built in prior to them joining or being added on. And if, if the council says, hey, we want to reduce all those for, by some amount. That means that's money we've already spent or have to spend, and the ratepayers will pick up that difference. That relates back to when we had the facility fees held no harm for 16 years, and then all of a sudden there was a great shock to the developers when they had to pay a higher fee because that's what it was costing. And until they started paying that freight, the ratepayers pay it. So this is what it would cost for to add that capacity because somebody's adding a house it'd be 680 or uh, the whatever the, the two added together and if a business came in and needed a 
three inch, that's what it would cost in the system. If they don't pay it, the ratepayers have to pay that. Um, one thing I want to mention is we are talking circles. So when you're looking at something going from a one inch to a two inch, you're not talking about a doubling in size. You're talking about four times increase yes. in the area. So again, from the two to the four is another quadrupling of the area. So from one to four is actually 16 times larger yeah, no cross-sectional mm -hmm. area so it's a lot more flow of water mm -hmm. which is why it's not just well why isn't it twice as much and three times as much and four times as much is because we're talking circles and how much faster or how much larger two inches is than a one inch and basically going back to my point the state has said you can't charge more than what it costs you That's to right. build that capacity in so this is the upper number but at the same time it's the cost using their formula that, is correct. that says that's what it costs to put that capacity in there for somebody to use. So I just want to make sure we have that appreciation. So if somebody goes to council and, and I understand this and says, gee, we want growth, so cut all these prices in half, that means the And citizen, the rate payers pick up the difference. That's right. This is not the general taxes. This is the enterprise fund that's picking it up. And the only place that money comes from is the users of the system. That is a true statement. Thank you. <laughs> so moving forward, we discussed this at the January 16th meeting with council where we, um, in more depth, outlined the supporting analysis that was done to generate the fee calculation. The fee calculation was presented, so council has seen the numbers, and, and those of you that were able to attend um, saw those. Uh, Stantec is currently working on the report. The report has to be out for 45 days for comment period. And what we're trying to do is shoot for a public hearing on April 17th, which is a regular council meeting. The, um, that's a seven o'clock meeting where we typically hold our public hearings. And then from there, we would be looking at taking back any comments from um, the, the public uh, comment period, the public meeting, and revising the report, any necessary, and then presenting it back to council on um, at their May 15th meeting for adoption. Now, depending obviously on the report and the generation of the report and the 45 day comment period, the 45 day comment period is. Um, required per the legislation. So if we're a little bit delayed with the report, those dates would slip by one month. But the idea is to have this in place by the end of this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, and just as a reminder, one thing that um, the legislation did is said that, you know, if somebody challenges this, if a developer, somebody that's paid the system development fees challenges your system development fee, they can only go back three years. So at the point it's adopted, it's basically saying this is it. They can't go back any more than three years from that date. And then as it rolls forward, they're limited to how far they can go back for three years. So it's important to kind of get this, you know, in as quickly as possible. But I think the, the good thing, um, you know, when we did this, I, w I was part of the um, facility fee study when we did this back in 2000, I think it was 2009, um, when we went to our current system. As you can see, you know, we've, we've adjusted it slightly, but based on the new legislation, we were not that far off of where we should have been. We're actually slightly below where we could have been. Um, so, that, and that's, you know, that's good. That shows that, you know, we weren't overcharging our developers or, or not too undercharging um, so that our rate payers had to pick that up based on, you know, the new calculations that are set forth in the legislation. And for, and for what it's worth, you're right, the, the developers, it, when we 
originally did this in 2009. I think for a single family home, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,700 a, a, a home. And this fee at that time showed that it needed to go to around 5,600, if I remember correctly. And the developers didn't come out against it. They, they were actually part of the process so they could, so we had an open process to where they could see it. And the only thing they said was, please don't hit us all at once. Right. So, they, you know, they, I will give our, the developers that we work with a lot, a lot of credit because, you know, they didn't come out kicking and screaming. They recognized that, you know, the city was growing, that we needed to invest the, the money in our water and sewer system. And that if we didn't invest that money, you know, they didn't have a long-term livelihood either. So they were supportive. They just asked that we not do it all at once. There are places that will not issue building permits because they do not have the water capacity. That's right. There are places. There's, that's happened in some places in Maryland and all. So, yeah. yep. And that's all I have. Uh, two things I'd like to, on that subject. Yes. One is that was brought up uh, at there that um, when, when this would be collected, this, after it's adopted, yes. there's a big thing about whether you collect it at the time of the permit or at the time of occupancy, and that was discussed. And is that still being looked at? That is still being looked at. That's an excellent point. There's, um, there is some language in the legislation that is... Confusing. Um, yes, I think that's a good way to say it. Because one of the things that um, created the lawsuit that you know, preempted this legislation was that the city that was charging the fees, they were called impact fees at the time, the city that was charging the fees was actually charging them at the time they would do a final plat. And a final plat may, um, a final plat typically comes before even all the streets are completed. So they were paying money, you know, a large sum of money, at the time they were recording a final plat, which just created lots, they still had to construct the infrastructure and construct the homes before anybody ever moved into it. And it's a, a little, the new legislation actually leaves some open-endedness that you could, you could do that. Um, and that's where you should lean toward. And I think there's um, some question about that and some clarification that will come out. I think where we're doing it, we've always done it, the building permit. If you want a building permit, you have to pay your fees. Um, that's at the time that a structure is going to be placed on the lot. And we actually have, we cited incidences where somebody came to build a home on a lot that they had purchased and got ordered somewhere else, so decided not to build their home, and they asked for their fees back. And we gave them their fees back because they didn't build their the house that they were planning to build. So we recognized that they were buying capacity. They didn't use that capacity, so we refunded it. Now, at the time that lot's developed, we'll collect fees for that lot at whatever the current fee is. But it didn't make sense to hold somebody's fees for something they've purchased that they're, they're not going to use or they couldn't use. And the other so, point of time that was discussed was at the time of occupancy that before you could get a certificate of occupancy for your business or your home, you'd have to you pay at that time for your... Well, the way we're currently set up now is where we we would like to avoid the certificate of occupancy for... Because by um, then they're already tied in, aren't they? Well, a lot of times, the one, the one that it actually impacts is whoever's moving in, especially a home, mm -hmm. because they'll, everybody's driving to a closing, and then all of a sudden, if a builder hasn't paid you know, five or six thousand dollars in fees, <laughs> and it may not be something that's easy to come up with sure. in the matter of a day or two when the closing is scheduled. And there's a lot of there we we actually have a lot where they try to close the same day the certificate of occupancy is issued or the next day because they're moving here, they're trying to get in as quickly as possible. So where we currently have it set at is the final inspection. And you have to have a final inspection done before you can even move toward a certificate of occupancy. So what we have now is a hold in our system. They have to pay their system development fees prior to us doing the final inspection of the home or business or whatever it is.
all subject to change in this review. That's correct. The Depending on the clarification that comes out from the legislation. The other question I had was, this is the system development fees. The rate will start, the rate review will start uh, soon now that this is coming to close? Yes. So we'll have a yes, rate Yes, we review. do have, and the, we have some adjust, adjustments to make in our rate study we the the rate study actually started before the system development fee started but then based on the legislation from the system development fee it changed our capital improvement plan and the way we program which all figures back into our rates and then making sure that those two correlate so we have some revisions to do in our rate and we'll be pushing that forward and we also have i know that you've been following the discussions that We've had with city council about the the sewer system as a whole mm -hmm. and what projects we're looking at and moving forward we have modeling that has just been completed so we'll be bringing that forward to city council and it may be that we can use that to adjust some of our projects so that may adjust it again and the same consultant doing both yes the, uh, that is correct system and the rate so, thank you okay next Anybody have any old business? <laughs> James? Wally, when you're talking about rate increases, you're talking about the sewer and water rates going up? Uh, I want to be clear and say that I did not say anything about <laughs> rate increases <laughs> for water and sewer. Okay. <laughs> Under this old business then, Tom Kale, uh -huh. when he was here two years ago, we brought up about possibly a half a percent increase so we wouldn't have to do another 4% like we had to do before because we went a number of years without an increase. And Tom and I did some talking about this, and uh, you remember when that was, couple. And uh, I just wondered it was something the council did not, I believe, wanted to do at that time. I think it's actually... Been two years ago, but I, I'd like to know if we're going to bring that back up again well i think that stopped at this board because i think yes, this board did. was actually split yeah we so <laughs> i think a good time to discuss that will be when we start talking about because we do have scheduled in there for the um when we talk start talking about our rate model we do have scheduled for the consultant to come talk to this group also so that would probably be an excellent time to talk about philosophies to recommend up to city council well let, let me say jim on this let's <laughs> say that well enough <laughs> yeah. let, let, jim, let me say out. this okay the, the question that you raise is mute at this point because they're doing a rate model and that will bring it to the current charge so to say you want a one percent above the rate model is is it doesn't make uh, logic once we get the new rate then we can talk about a year or two later if we want to have a quarter percent or half percent. But well, that's what I was trying to yeah. see if that's yeah, what we're, we're going to have new accurate figures, yes. and that's going to make a difference. The, the yeah. rate is going to be what you can charge by law, and there's yeah. no more. Well, I know everything's going up, all the chemicals and everything like that that we have to have, salaries and all like that, and there's got to be something or we're going to have the same position again where we're going to have a three percent or four percent and well, it's too late you know, i mean whatever the rate model shows is whatever and if it's 16 sure percent that was in the rate model what we were discussing about. Okay. we we think we've been managing it well enough that it won't be yeah. that yeah. but we'll, we'll see what comes out of the rate model but i and i'm hoping that at least in the short term you won't see any big surprises hoping and we can do the same thing for ratepayers that you talked about. The developers just don't give them any big shocks. Yes. Now on the budget coming up and all, we'll make sure that. Okay. <laughs> do you have anything? The only thing I have, we have not had an UNWASA meeting for several months now. We should have one next, this coming Tuesday. We didn't have one in December, and it's every other month. I think everybody's got their thing here that shows the planning and permitting updates. If there's any questions about this, this is the first time I've seen this. We haven't had it before. Here's two different sheets. Uh, does anybody have any questions on it? 
Arby's and Gateway. A Gateway, we have not seen that at the planning board yet. <clears throat> it's going to be on Western Boulevard. 305 acre track of land. They're going to have nine commercials and one storm lot water. Storm water lot. Uh, I don't know where that is going to be at. Where did you say, Wally? It, um, that track is actually very close to the um, New Jersey Mike's. Um, oh, the new one. It, as, as you travel on Western Boulevard toward Gun Branch Road, you have Jersey Mike's and Massage MV or something right in a little strip center. And Longhorn, it's right in that general vicinity. I know that's going to be a fairly large 305 acres. It's going to be large. It's, going to be it's not going to be that big. No, no, I don't think so. It's I not going to use the, the whole track, obviously. Yes. You can't. It's, 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 it's just, a, I think a portion of it is yeah. commercial and then part of it is residential. How and this is the preliminary. Track down further down Western Boulevard, the one they were going to put thousand houses on it at one time. Uh, are you talking about the Cypress Creek or yeah. Vineyards track? 330. No, it's that's like 330 that. some CBS, acres. Like that. They were going to put a bunch of houses in there and then they backed yeah. out of the deal on it. Yes. I think it was out of Raleigh or something. Two people I don't backed know. out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a large track too, I think. 376 acres or something. Okay, that's all I have. I'll have something next time on, on Wassa. Did you have something you I was just going to ask if the way we provided you this uh, supplemental form is okay. It's really hard for planning when we have our meeting into the first week of the month mm -hmm. for them to pull all of their reports and give them to us in time for the mail out for it to get to you. Mm -hmm. If the, the other way we can do it is you'll be a month delayed, but with planning and permitting, that's quite a bit of a delay. So if you're okay when it's when it falls the second meeting or the second week into the month it's fairly easy for them to have a week to pull everything together but when it's when we're we're a day or two into the month and we're saying we need it i'm so, fine with okay. this so as long as you're fine with, with the supplemental yeah, yeah. Just, okay just so you know that you're not doing these permits like we used to in the past we're doing a lot of uh, rezoning and such as that. We're not seeing the plans like what we used to. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is brand new to me, too. I don't get to see it until I get it here. Any other new business? I think we're done. I move that we adjourn. I second it. All in favor of that motion? <laughs> the meeting's adjourned. Good evening, everybody.